So I'm Eric Smith. I'm on the uh, OPSIG board. Um, I'm the editor for the uh, OPSIG publication, the Dispatcher's Office. I've been doing that for you know, almost five years. I've been in the OPSIG for a long time, um, at least at least 15 years, I believe. I'm still on the young side of the model railroad industry, but I've uh, uh, been doing it since I was a kid. Um, so let me bring up the presentation oh. here. All right, everybody see that? Yep, looks good. Okay. So a uh, little bit about the op the operations SIG. We are a NMRA recognized special interest group. We are probably one of the largest groups out there. We have almost 1,400, 1400 people in the group. Um, uh, just a quick request, if you, I'm getting some feedback on the audio. If you can mute yourself, I'd appreciate it. Uh, so the Operation SIG is, is basically dedicated to, you know, a, a niche within the niche hobby of model railroading is doing uh, realistic operations on model railroads. No matter what the scale, no matter what the size, there's always a place for model railroad operations. Uh, I personally think it's the best way to um, really add some interest to a model railroad. And uh, like I said, I got into it back when I was at the Purdue Club, uh, the Purdue Model Railroad Club at Purdue University, uh, a little bit north of where I live now. Um, kind of got hooked on doing operations there. And that was uh, over 30 years, or I want to say 90, 1988. So uh, over 30 years ago. Uh, for more information about the OPSIG, go to OPSIG.org. Uh, you can join for uh, $10 a year for our digital membership. We produce a high quality 40-page uh, magazine. Uh, you can get it in print format for 25 bucks a year if you're in the U.S., which I think all of you are. Um, pretty much anything operations related, both you know, information about the prototype, how to do various things on the model, and so on. So we'd love to have you. That said, um, so model railroads kind of fall into a, a couple of different categories. And again, these are not, these are just things I've made up. So don't, uh, you know, don't read too much into this, but uh, there are the typical starter layouts. Um, I don't know how many of us probably had a four by eight sheet of, I had a four by eight sheet of plywood in my bedroom, got the trains running on it. Uh, they didn't run very well because it was brass track and I didn't know about cleaning wheels and the engines weren't very good, but I still had a railroad in my, in my room growing up. Um, even in the uh, various uh, model railroad groups on Facebook, there's always people talking about, you know, oh, I got a four by eight sheet of plywood. What do I need? I'm like, well, don't necessarily start with a four by eight sheet of plywood, at least not the big the big rectangle. There, there's lots of other types of railroads, but it's a place to start. Um, you know, trains run around in circles, 500 miles an hour, and maybe the kids get bored with it, or you run it around the tree. I mean, we, you know, even with the railroad I have in the basement, we still set up my Lego train around the tree, even though my girls are both, you know, late teens moving up close to, you know, One's out of high school, the other one's not quite out of high school yet, but we put it up for Christmas. So that's kind of the starter layout. Uh, display layouts, these are really, you know, uh, things like the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago, uh, Miniature Wonderland in Hamburg, um, both amazing layouts, but they are essentially just great big loops of track or multiple loops of track or, you know, Hamburg is, you know, insanely complicated loop of track, but it's still, you know, it's there for a display. It's not to, to really operate on. Um, time saver or switching puzzles. These are just, they're, they're basically games, um, depending on who's doing it. Sometimes they're there to just frustrate people. Um, but I, I'm not a fan of them. 
other than maybe it gets somebody thinking on how do you move things, move cars around. Um, but really what we're talking about is this group called an operational layout. Now, why do we want, you know, why would you do this, right? You could just run your trains around in a circle and some people are happy doing that. Uh, I, I have a good friend who's has a gorgeous layout. You know, it's, you know, floor to ceiling mountains. It's a narrow gauge, uh, I think it's HON3. Looks beautiful and that's what he likes to do. He likes to build scenery. That's his interest and that's fine. You know, there's, there's nothing wrong with that. It's always a great, great draw for our layout tours. Um, some people really don't want to share their layout with other people. They want to have it for themselves. Um, there's, there's several around that are like that. They, they run it for themselves. They like running the trains around and you know maybe it's there for the grandkids instead of for themselves. But you know, with that said, there, there's a lot of reasons that you can add an operational aspect to your railroad. Um, Given the, the average age of most model railroaders, you know, getting up into the 60s, 70s, and so on, there's something to be said, and there's probably some scientific evidence for this, that doing things like puzzles and crosswords and things to keep your mind active, especially once you've retired, um, I'm, I'm not anywhere near, well, not as close, not as far as I used to be, but I'm certainly not retired yet. But I know my you know, my dad personally, he doesn't do much. You know, he, he he's you know has some medical issues, and he could he can benefit from doing this. You know, the idea that you need to you need to solve a problem. The train comes in, you have cars you need to move from your train to the tracks in the town. It's not terribly complicated, but there is still a problem solving aspect to it. Um, including that, it, it improves your modeling, right? Because now all those tracks you've got, there's a reason that they exist, right? All those tracks in the, the switching district, well, you need to have industries. You've got to have places for the cars to park, right? The cars don't just pull up to a blank wall. Well, you need to put a dock door. You need to put a, you know, some sort of an unloading pit or a, a loading system, you know, if it's like a... a, a a grain, uh, like a grain elevator, for instance, there's going to be some sort of way to to load that, or a, you know, if it's a place for like a power plant, power plant, you might have a big balloon track for your cars to unload, um, or you know, when you're loading them, you have a balloon track to load them up. So you, you start looking at the train cars, and you know, looking at the industries that you have, and you start putting them together to say, well. I don't know what I would bring to this industry. Well, maybe it's box cars, maybe it's containers, maybe it's tank cars. So you start putting the cars together with the buildings that you're putting there. And you start putting the things together to say, well, I'm gonna make this a more realistic industry that I you know, might have a train coming to visit. Um, the big thing, and obviously COVID has kind of locked, you know, knocked the legs out from under this, is it gives you a social, it gives you a social aspect to your railroad you've done a lot of work to build this railroad or for the people who don't have the space, you're giving them a place to operate. Maybe that you let them bring their trains or their engines or something to run on your railroad, you know, with appropriate inspections and so on. Um, you build this group of fellow operators, you know, who run regularly with you. And then you've got the idea of, well, you can go, you know, you know, in a typical year, you could probably find an operations event somewhere in the country at least once a month, if not every week. Um, you know, I, I've gotten to operate on a lot of different layouts. Um, the, the pictures are up on the OPSEG Facebook page um, of all, you know, a lot of the places I've been, you know, in Michigan and in Illinois, out up in up in Minnesota, out in Kansas City, um, the, the, there's lots of railroads out there, and you get to go. Especially as somebody I'm building a railroad, I can take lots of pictures and pick out things that well, I like the way this works, or well, I didn't really like how this industry worked here. This this was confusing, or this yard arrangement worked well, or 
this might work, but there's some, you know, you can kind of pick and choose good things and bad things about it, especially when you're operating. Uh, the last thing is it gives your railroad something to do. At a certain point, that circle burner is going to get boring, right? The, the train's just going around in a circle. It's not doing anything. Well, add on a couple sightings, and now you've got a reason for that train to go in the circle, right? It's moving freight between this sighting and this other sighting, or this industry and another industry. So what is an operational layout? And these are just, just some, some ideas I have. Again, these are not, not uh, comprehensive at all, but um, every train, every car, every track has a purpose. Um, you know, you built that, you built this, this switching district. Well, those are gonna be, there's an industry here, there's an industry here. This is a, a, a drill track that we need for switching. This yard, I've got these eight tracks here for, for switching. I have these two arrival departure. Trains are going to leave from this staging yard, come through here, drop cars off on these tracks. You know, these tracks here are dedicated to a branch line or, or something to that effect. Um, every car you have now has a reason to exist other than, you know, and sometimes it's just, well, I like that car. You know, I, I like the color of that car. Or, I have some cars of places I've been to, you know, or there's the commemorative cars or, you know, club cars and so on. But even those, those, I can put those into operation, right? The, the Purdue Railroad Clubber Hopper, well, that's, that's running, that's running freight on my railroad. You know, the, uh, there's no reason you can't put some of these cars into, into play. Um, operations are intentional. Um, they're not just you know, random, I'm just going to take my trains down to the club and run. Well, there's nothing wrong with that, but that's not operations. That's, you know, operations, there is, there is a set of rules that you've decided on. And before you say rules make it unfun, that, that's not really true. It's, you know, rules are not meant to be punitive. They're meant to, to give, you know, just like Monopoly has rules or any game you have has rules. It's simply a way that you've agreed that you're going to run the trains. Um, and they don't have to be complex. Uh, rules can be something as simple as, okay, you're going to take your train from here to here. When you get to this siding here, you're going to take, if there's two cars there, well, you take those two cars and you leave two of yours. Um, you need to wait for permission when you get to this, you know, the, the red phone tack. That's the end of the block. You can't go any further than that. You have to call the dispatcher. Um, or it can be incredibly you know, complicated in something we call timetable and train order, where you've got a sheet saying, okay, I have to look at the clock on the wall and the clock says it's you know 12.33. All right, well, I'm in this town. Okay, wait, I gotta get off the main because there's another train that's scheduled to come through here. And you know, again, it's, it's all a matter of how you wanna do it. But all of those make an operational layout. And there's, you know, every combination under the sun of these various, these various rules and various schemes. Um, operations can work on any scale and any physical size railroad, uh, whether it's a two by four switching module that you can put on your desk to a, you know, many, many acre outdoor railroad um, which, by the way, if you ever get a chance to do an operating session on outdoor railroad, highly recommend it. It's it's a completely different, completely different experience than being able to pick the car up with your hand and move it around. Yeah, you can't do that when the when it's a cement hopper that literally is filled with cement. You know, it, it takes a little bit more work. <laughs> um, now, certain things as the trains get smaller, you know, down to end gauge. It gets kind of hard to see those numbers, even for me. Um, so there are ways you can you can mitigate those those things, but it doesn't mean you can't still run it as an operational layout. Um, the size of the layout doesn't matter. You can do great operations on small switching layouts, a small you know branch line in a spare room. It's you're just setting up some rules. You're allowing other people to come operate it. Typically, but you know it may just be one or two people depending on the size. Um, now, 
I'll say that this is typically not for, you know, most, most NMRA groups will have layout tours to let people come in and see trains. Sometimes they're for the public, sometimes they're for model railroads, you know, model railroaders. I know when I go see these railroads, I kind of like to see the train moving simply so I can follow a train around the railroad, um, as opposed to somebody sitting there switching. You know, whether you want to do that or not, most operational layouts can, can flip a switch or do something so that they can basically run trains continuously or close to continuously. I mean, in my, my particular case, I have yards at either end. So if I get to the point where my layout is, you know, not crappy and isn't the plywood Pacific, I can run trains enough to make it look like there's something going on, you know, to, to give people something to look at. So uh, there's about, these five things are what we're gonna talk about as far as the components of operations on a railroad. Um, the idea of off stage and on stage, uh, traffic control, how do trains move on the railroad, freight movement, you know, how are we simulating freight being picked up from one place and delivered to an industry? Uh, passengers, same thing, passengers are going from point A to point B. Um, how do we, how can we simulate that? And then some special, special operations that make the, the sessions more interesting, kind of throw wrenches into the normal plan. So uh, staging, uh, the best way to think about this is like a theater stage. Um, during the play or during the show or whatever, things will come, there will be people on the stage in front of you and there's things off stage, things that haven't happened yet. Somebody may come in from one side of the stage and leave to another one uh, or go to the other side, go off stage. They, they come in, do their, you know, say their line or do their thing and then they're gone. You may never see them again. Model railroads are very very similar. Uh, when we talk about operations, um, real model railroads don't run in a circle, you know, except for like reverse loops and balloon tracks. But generally, we are going, we are modeling some stretch of track between, you know, uh, Memphis and Atlanta, or Chicago and Minneapolis, or it's you were going from two points. We're essentially building a line, right? It's always, there's always some portion that we're modeling and then everything that's off stage is stuff that we're not modeling, right? We, we simply don't have the space. Um, in my case, I'm modeling from uh, basically St. Paul and, and Minneapolis up Northwest about 150 miles into Minnesota. And then my off stage as well, I could play places east like Chicago, Milwaukee, places west would be the Dakotas, Seattle, Portland, up into Canada, Calgary, and so on. So there's the part that's on stage and that's parts of the part that's off stage. Some trains will stay on stage, so stay on the layout the whole time. A local train working from one yard to an industry and then back. A train is constantly visible. Other trains like the, you know, let's take something like the Amtrak's Empire Builder, right? It runs from Chicago to Seattle. It's gonna come on out of the staging yard. It's gonna traverse the railroad and then it's gonna leave. That's its job. It's, it's simply adding traffic to the railroad. Um, we're not modeling all the way out to Seattle. I don't have the space, but I do wanna have that traffic coming through because it's, it's simulating the way it would be, you know, it's it's typical traffic for the railroad. Sometimes the train train might come in from off stage, do something, and then go back the same direction. All right, if my, you know, for the Canadian National train, well, it comes down to St. Paul, and then it goes back up towards Toronto. It doesn't go the other. It doesn't go further west. Uh, St. Paul is the end of the line for. And talking about that, staging tracks basically let us do this, okay? Staging tracks can be simple parking tracks, or they can actually be yards where the cars are being rearranged by somebody during an operating session. Um, that's sometimes called active staging. Uh, the train comes in, uh, you might be, you know, if you're really limited on space, 
uh, think like a very small switching layout, you're physically taking, you might be physically taking those cars off the railroad, putting them in a drawer, and those cars have now left the railroad. They're on to a town to the east or the west. Um, and then you're taking other cars out of the drawer, putting them up on the track and getting them ready for the next train coming in. In my case, I have eight tracks on the west end. I have eight tracks on the east end. So I'll have trains that can go back and forth. And I have enough space for that because um, I don't really want to pick up the train. I don't want to pick up the cars and take them off the track at this point. Um, that's just, I mean, they're not that fancy. I just, I just figure, well, I'll get enough to, to do that for now. Um, uh, some people like to take the cars off the land, as I said, you know, if they're limited on space. Um, these staging tracks, in my case, because of the space of the room, they're stub ended. So when the train comes in, it's going to go engines in and it's going to stop, right? It's going to head, head into the end of the track. And between sessions, I have to turn the train. So it's ready to go back out from the, you know, if it came in from the West, well, it's going to go out the next session. It's going to, uh, come in from the east, back and forth. Um, other people, if they've got space, they have, and I'll show you some pictures here, we will use a reverse loop to simplify turning of trains during a session or between sessions. Um, if, I, if I had space, I would have done this. I didn't, so. And the joke about staging tracks is if you think you need end tracks, you really need N plus one. Uh, it's just the, <laughs> The nature of staging tracks, you could always use more, more space, right? There's always that other train to buy. <laughs> so these are some pictures of some staging tracks. And this is Mike Tomei's uh, ATSF Albuquerque division, Kansas City. In his case, he's got four, this is one layer of his staging tracks. He has another one above where this picture is. So the trains basically come in on the, in the picture, they come in on the right-hand side, they go around the loop, and basically they're ready to head back the other direction in the next session or even in the same session. So for instance, it looks like he's got a mixed freight, maybe a container or a trailer, trailer train there that may just be traversing the railroad. We don't know, but this is a, this is a great way to do that. As I said, he's got another one of these right above it for the other end of the railroad. So his staging tracks are always <clears throat> His trains are always basically ready to go. Uh, this particular railroad, this is the South <coughs> South Oakland Club in Detroit. Uh, it's the same thing. The train comes in. You can see this uh, uh, top and bottom are basically set up the same way. Uh, the train comes in, goes all the way down to that black uh, in the picture on the on the left. That black square down at the at the very end is a tunnel. There's a reverse loop. The train comes back and parks in one of the tracks. Um, same thing on the upper deck. Uh, that way the trains are always ready to go. Uh, this final picture is from uh, Jim Rollweg's Denver Pacific. He lives near uh, Dayton, Ohio. In his case, you can see some of the engines are pointed towards the left. Some of them are pointed to the UC Cabooses because he's got a stub-ended uh, stub ended station. I believe this is his, uh, I'm trying to remember if this was uh, his Union Station or not. I don't think it was. But in this case, he'll have to pull these trains out, turn them between the sessions. Okay. All right. So moving on, traffic control. Um, in the real world, trains don't move without permission. Okay, you have some sort of permission to move. Now, it might be that, well, you're the only train on this particular block of track, <coughs> you know, some sort of a, a branch line, you may be following signals. Well, the signals are your permission to, to move across that railroad. Uh, within a yard, the yard master is giving control within the yard limits. Um, and there may be places where trains have to coordinate with each other without the dispatcher involvement. Let's say you have a, two trains coming up to a meet and there's a, a siding and they kind of have to seesaw around each other. But the idea is that you're not, you're always moving with permission. And so types of traffic control, um, free for all, <laughs> uh, 
yeah, we, I think we've all seen this. Um, if you're in an, especially on like at an open house, it basically don't hit the train ahead of you. All right. It's just, uh, I used to be a member of the Hennepin Overland Model Railroad Club up in uh, Minnesota, uh, up in the Twin Cities when I lived up there. And they had a, I want to say it was a four track wide, four track wide helix that was probably six feet tall. So at some point during the open house, every train on the railroad was going to be in that helix, right? It's just, it's just inevitable. <laughs> um, and so when you, once you got out of the helix, once you're on the main, pretty much it was just, you know, they didn't hit, this was back in the days of just cab control and there was only one cab, right? Everybody was, you know, getting the same voltage. And so it was essentially just making sure that your train wasn't creeping up on the one ahead of it. And if it did, well, you just had, had to physically lift your train off the, off the track because it wasn't even blocked. So um, the next level of this would be verbal orders. Dispatch gives, gives train, you know, UP 122 permission from town number one to town number two. And, you know, town number one and number two are marked on the railroad in some fashion, you know, whether it's a station, whether it's a sign, whether it's labeling. And the engineer knows, okay, I can go from here to here, and I can't go any further because the dispatcher sees either somebody ahead of me or somebody's coming at me. Um, so the dispatcher is basically keeping track of where the trains are on the railroad. Um, there are obviously more complicated options. I'm personally planning to do signals at some point. Um, they are expensive. Uh, I mean, there are some cheap alternatives. Um, if anybody knows Seth Newman from California, his model railroad control systems company has some uh, dollar signals. Uh, they're basically printed on a piece of PC board. You hook, you've got four little solder pads and you can hook them up to your your detection six your system but it does require you know hardware to detect where the trains are um, the signal logic there are places like as tracks that have they call they have signals with detection but they're really nothing more than just timers you know the, the idea is when the train goes by okay it turns red and then it waits 30 seconds flips yellow waits another 30 and turns green um, what i'm talking about is true you know, detected signals and so on. But either way, it's still a way to control traffic. Um, another option, uh, paper signals. And I'll show you this in a second. Um, and then timetable and train order is probably the most complicated and it's the most paperwork intensive version. Uh, it requires a fair amount of training, especially, to, and it's always gonna be different depending on the railroad you go to. You know, the idea of a timetable is, will carry over, but as far as what the timetable is, where the towns are, that's gonna be different on every railroad that you operate on. But as far as the paper signals, this was in the April 2017 issue of Model Railroader. Um, this is a very cheap way to provide signals to your operators. Your dispatcher essentially walks around, puts the signal into the little holder, and when the train goes by, the, the train up, you know, the engineer or the conductor essentially pulls the, pulls the signal out that was there, so it goes back to all red. Uh, it's a nice, if it's a very simple system, um, you know, it lets you get the idea of signals without a, a huge investment, other than a little bit of cardboard and some color printing. Um, the verbal order system, uh, this would be, and also with the paper ones, you, you kind of have to keep track of where the trains are. The simplest thing is a whiteboard or a magnet board. Uh, the board shows the schematic of the track plan, you know, whether it's a single track, whether it's a double track section, where the sightings are, where the industries are. And then the dispatcher is going to communicate with the train crews. Most people are using the, the cheap family radios, you know, FRS radios. Um, or if it's a small enough railroad, then the dispatcher is just kind of poking his head out of the hole saying, okay, uh, UP123, you're clear from here to here. Um, I personally like the radios uh, because it, especially in the era of COVID where we have, uh, we'll talk a little bit about remote operations, the idea that your dispatcher may actually not be at 
the session. Uh, there is software called JMRI that makes it entirely possible for your dispatcher to actually be remote watching the operations just like a real dispatcher does, right? You know, from, you know, the UP dispatch center, you know, there's one dispatch center for most railroad, you know, most class one railroads now. So that's also possible in our world. These are some examples of some tracking boards. This is Larry Hickman's River Falls and Eastern Railroad. Um, you can basically see the main line going through there, the red, shows the turnouts, it's a little bit of a glare, I apologize for that. But he can see where the trains are. He's got all of his trains kind of lined up at either end of his railroad. The magnets are actually made up, made little arrows to make it easier to tell which way the trains are going. You can see there's one, two, uh, looks like three or four rail trains on the railroad right now. Uh, here's another version, same concept. Um, this is Mike Finkler's Pennsylvania Railroad Toledo Division. He's also near, he lives in near Toledo. Um, same idea. And the idea is that as you move through the, the railroad, the engineer is calling in saying, I'm, you know, this, this is 122. I'm at town, you know, whatever the name of the town is. I'm at Toledo. Then your dispatcher essentially moves the magnet, gives you a new clearance, and you continue. Um, you can also do this with an Excel sheet. This was from Chip Cole's CSX Railroad. He's been in Model Railroad a few times. Um, he just he basically just grabbed these cells and then cut them and paste them here. Or I think they're actually, uh, he can basically click and drag and put them onto the, the screen in various places. Uh, it's basically a, a drawn on box on an Excel sheet. And then he just kind of lays out his his track plan using Excel cells. Um, as far as communications, like I said, radio communications are a, a pretty inexpensive option. I mean, you can get the, the family radios with rechargeable batteries, you can get earpieces for them so you can look like a Secret Service guy or a headset or whatever, pretty, pretty cheaply. Um, some people, if they're modeling older railroads, they'll opt for phone systems. There are uh, simple PBX systems you can get for your railroad to actually give you a phone type system. I've even seen a few where they actually use a, like a uh, like a Morse code repeater uh, to actually have to tap your, I, I kid you not, I've seen pictures of it. I've never operated there, but I'm like, yeah, no, I, I'm good with a radio. <laughs> um, if you're going to do this, I would recommend earpieces of some sort, uh, just to cut down the background noise. Um, whoever is talking on the rail radios needs to learn radio discipline, meaning keep it short, keep it sweet. You know, acknowledge who you are, acknowledge the caller, get your information out quickly, and get off the rail, get off the radio. If you've got something long and complicated, either you need to go to a different channel or you need to just get up and go find the person and ask what they're talking about. Um, uh, with larger railroads, they'll typically use separate channels for, uh, they might use a separate channel for the yard, they might have a separate channel for the crew room, you know, to basically announce, okay, we need, you know, this crew come report and pick up your train, um, something to that effect. All right, uh, so we've gotten all this stuff. We've gotten the trains controlled. Now we really want to make some money here. And the only way we make money on our railroad is moving freight. Um, this is really, this is what I think makes things more interesting. The, the other things you need to make, make things a little bit more orderly, but this is really where the, the simulation can get, can get um, interesting. So, uh, most operational railroads will have some sort of scheme for how they how they exchange cars, how they're moving freight. Again, cars would move with a purpose. You're not moving a car from point A to point B unless it's unless it's either going to be going to be loaded or going to be unloaded. Now, occasionally you have to move things around. You know, it's it's being returned to its home railroad or something. But there's a reason for that car to move. And every car has an instruction as to where it's going. Um, we have different types of trains running on our, every railroad. 
And again, depending on your era, some of these things may not exist. I model modern. Uh, so we, modern trains, especially in the Midwest, lots of unit trains, you know, a whole hundred, hundred, hundred plus car, car length train of coal, oil tankers coming out of the Dakotas are very common these days. Uh, potash coming down from Canada, grain, lots and lots and lots of grain, intermodal. I mean, for anything modern, really intermodal has kind of replaced the boxcar in a lot of cases, not entirely, but certainly the, uh, you know, a fair amount of traffic is intermodal. Um, you also have what I'm calling a manifest freight or a mixed freight. This, on in my particular railroad, Manifest freights move cars between yards. Um, unit trains typically aren't switching on my railroad. You might have a coal train, you know, unloading at a balloon track at a power plant or an oil train coming into a refinery, or it may just be passing through. But manifest freight, this is where the mixed, mixed cars, they're going to be heading to an industry somewhere on the railroad or being, they will have been picked up from an industry and they're heading off off to points east or west. Uh, local trains, these are, um, at least in my world, these move cars between the yards and the industries. The, the manifest freights aren't stopping to switch every little industry along the way. They're dropping their, their cut of cars, you know, a group of cars in a yard. And then the local trains are moving those cars out to the various towns and the industries along the way. Now, whether you simulate it or not, every freight car goes through um, a pretty simple set of cycles, right? The car is empty at some point. Uh, the industry requests an empty car or more than one, obviously, and the car has to get delivered there to get loaded, whether it's a car, you know, box car or a freight car, box car, a coal car, whatever. The car is gonna get loaded at that industry that load is going to a destination. It might be on your railroad, it might be off the railroad. But at some point that, you know, that industry is attached to your main line, you've got it, your responsibility is to get that car moving to its next step. The car is gonna get picked up with the industry and move to the load's destination. Now that move may take multiple steps. Uh, at least on my railroad, that car is gonna get picked up by a local. It's gonna get taken to the, the yard that services that that town, the appropriate manifest freight going in the right direction is going to pick that up and take it to its take it off the railroad. You know whether it's heading west or it on east. You know it's it's either heading west or east, and it's on one of four railroads. Those are the, the manifest freights that run back and forth on my trains on my railroad, and eventually that car is going to get unloaded at the destination. Um, and then you start all over again. That car either comes back to a yard, it goes, or it goes to, to another industry to get reloaded. Uh, that load and unload may, both places may be on your railroad, they may not. That's really up to you. I've seen schemes where every single, you know, it's what's called a two cycle, where essentially the car is, you do something with it on your railroad and then you take it off every single one. That's how he wanted to simulate it. Um, and obviously there's a number of ways you can do this. Any combination of, you know, you might load it and then take it off stage. You might unload it, take it off stage. You might move it from one industry to another on your railroad. That's perfectly fine too. Or it may just be passing through. You know, one of those intermodal cars, I'm probably not gonna be switching those. Okay, they're just, they're just moving through. How you do it is entirely up to you. But as far as how the trains are set up, um, and again, this may vary depending on the type of railroad you have, but these are some of the types of trains that you might be operating. So a unit train, let's take a, uh, a coal drag coming out of uh, the, like the Powder River Mine in Wyoming, and it's heading to the, the big power plant in Michigan City that I grew up near. Okay, well, this one isn't going to be switching. It's going straight through, no stops other than maybe a crew change. If you're on somebody else's railroad, this is the type of train I like to get first, all right? Because what it's typically going to do is it's going to let me see most of the railroad, right? It's probably going to be, it's going to start in a staging yard. 
It's going to traverse a good chunk of the railroad. I might have to stop somewhere to simulate a crew change. Um, but typically, it's going to be a pretty simple job to get done. Um, it's going to have the fewest stops. It's going to have minimal switching. And really, for new operators, this lets you focus just on, OK, I need to know where these towns are. I need to understand, OK, how are we doing switching? Are we doing timetables? You kind of have to focus on one thing or the other when you're first learning a railroad, learning how to operate. Uh, when it comes to unit train planning, as much as I'd love to have a 100 car coal train or a 100 car, you know, what they call the brown earthworms that BNSF runs of green cars, I don't have room for 100 cars. Uh, it would look ridiculous on my railroad. It would actually traverse the basement two or three times. Um, you need to size the trains. You always need to size the trains to your, to your space. Um, in my case, my trains are no more than about 11 or 12 feet long, which is probably uh, less than 20 cars at modern lengths. Um, my trains, the goal is to not go through more than one town or scene at a time, or, or no more than two, right? It's leaving one, entering another one. Um, that way my passing sidings, my staging tracks are all big enough to accommodate the trains. When you're laying out these trains, you need to make sure you're sequencing them so you don't overload one yard or the other. You can't have three trains all depart from the west end of the railroad when you don't have enough tracks at the other end. You, you gotta make sure that you're, you're having trains leave from both ends um, or at least saying, okay, we'll have one from, from the west, then we'll do one from the east and vice versa. Um, at some point, your train might have to turn around um, if you're modeling modern diesels, um, for several reasons, my trains are all pulled by at least two, two diesels. I just point one in each direction. And when I, when the train gets to the other end, I back it up, move the power around and I'm good to go for the next time. With steam, you're either picking it up and turning it around, which I, I have one steam engine and I don't like touching it because it's got lots of little tiny parts on it. Uh, so you're going to need either a turntable or a reverse loop to, to turn that around. So it's just something we need to think about with, with these trains um, or any of the, especially unit trains that are basically just kind of passing through your railroad. Okay. Manifest trains and local trains. Again, in my case, I use my manifest freights. Uh, manifest freight will leave one staging yard. It has, it will stop at the yards along the way and then go into the other staging yard. Um, each one is a particular railroad. So I have a UP westbound that goes through and picks up the UP bound cars. Uh, same thing for CN, CP and BNSF. Each train goes one direction in the session and kind of, uh, some people will call it a sweeper, but it's the idea that it's moving those freights, freight cars that are leaving the railroad off to points unknown. Uh, the local trains, uh, each yard that I have services two or more towns. Um, the locals, you know, are built up in those yards. The cars go out to the out to the industries and come, you know, the basically we exchange at the industries at those towns and bring them back to those local yards. Um, now again, that's just my case. There are some industrial layouts that only have local trains. Right, they don't have that big, the big run through trains. They don't have the unit trains. They are just doing locals. Um, I've also been on railroads that don't have locals. All they have is run through trains. Um, now that can, that particular railroad got really boring after a while because all it was was just flat out. It was double track the whole way. You pretty much didn't have to stop. You just didn't hit the person ahead of you. It made for a very uninteresting day. <laughs> um, so as far as how you lay out the trains, it's really up to you. I personally like to go on railroads that I can do a mix of things. You know, maybe it's switching a big yard, maybe it's working an industry, working a local, um, you know, throwing in some passenger trains for fun. Okay. 
So here's a couple examples. Um, so in this case, this is from the model railroader uh, industry database. Down at the lower left, you see the track marked as interchange track. Um, this is basically where cars are coming on and off this particular rail. This is one that you could do operations on, even though it's, you know, maybe, uh, what is a grid here, 20 by 20. So it's maybe 40 feet of track, but there's plenty of industries there. This would be, this would be rich for operations. Um, but the idea is that when the car gets to the interchange track, you may actually have to physically lift it off the track to make more room or to be able to exchange cars between sessions. Okay. But again, you can do that here just as well as on a larger one. Uh, we had a gentleman present his Port of Catoosa Railroad. It's basically shaped like an E with um, you know, the peninsula is going down. He switches it. His sessions take four hours. He has three people operating it. And it's the same thing. You know, he has he has space to accommodate the cars leaving the railroad. There's space to accommodate cars coming in from somewhere else. And then they simply get switched during the session. Now, how you do your how you do your freight work, there's a number of different options, and we don't we don't have a ton of time to go into all of these, but the, the idea is to get started somewhere. Um, the one we started at the beginning was just a simple exchange system. Your train, you pull into this, and you're you're told, okay, you're going to go to industries A, B, and C. Okay, industry A has two cars. All right, you pick those two up and you replace them with two from your own train. Okay, move to the next town. From any of the cars you have left, exchange your cars with the ones that are in the industry. It's a very simple system. There's no paperwork. There's no you don't have to worry about the car numbers are, but it does get you it does get you thinking about you know, how are you, how are you doing this freight delivery, right? You're simply saying, okay, we are simulating the idea of we're moving freight. Okay, this is good for beginners or somebody who's never been on a railroad. Um, you, you just, you know, you can kind of keep, kind of keep things going and keep it very simple. Um, there's another system called a car order system. This is sort of the next step up. Um, instead of focusing on, okay, I need SP boxcar number one, two, three, four, five, six. All I really care about is I need a 40 foot boxcar or I need a, a, uh, a covered hopper or I need a short covered hopper. You, you can kind of group the cars into something, especially on a smaller, smaller scale like N scale where you can see the car, but you, it's gonna be really hard to read those numbers, especially when those cars are lined up in a yard and you can't quite see down between them. Um, the, uh, uh, I'm not sure exactly who started it, but I've seen this a uh, number of places, including in the, uh, uh, the Los Angeles Model Railroad Society that presented yesterday for our operations uh, meetup. They're using this system. I'll show you the cards here. So the idea is that the car basically alternates between being a car order meaning an industry has requested, in this case, a 40-foot box car be delivered to Allegheny Milling, which is somewhere on the railroad, parking spot two. And, you know, the spots are going to be numbered. The, this car will originate from a yard somewhere on the railroad. A train will bring it. Once that car has been delivered to that spot, you flip the car over, cart over, and in the next session, well, now this car is going to get picked be picked up from here, and it's going to be sent to Harrisburg. Wherever Harrisburg is, um, that might be on the railroad. It might not be. We don't know. And then basically, this this order is then flipped back over, and at some point, we'll send another forty foot box car to this spot on the track. We don't care which forty foot box car. It doesn't matter. It's just we're picking up a particular type of car. The other option that a lot of people are familiar with, these are some pictures from Bruce Chubb's Sunset Valley Railroad. Railroad. These are um, car cards and waybills. As you can see, um, he has a picture of the car itself. So this is a, uh, like a, the one on the left is a Southern Pacific Hank car with a particular number. The other one's a pulpwood hopper or a pulpwood flat car. 
those have particular numbers on them. That card, that particular one is indicating that that particular car, not any, you know, that one by number is expected to go from, uh, from Terminal 4 or Consolidated Petroleum somewhere on the railroad, and it's going to Ashland, Oregon, which is a particular location on his railroad. So whoever is building this train has to find that particular car, put it on the right train. Um, and when that car gets there, at some point, that waybill will be pulled out and there's another step in it. You can see in the upper right-hand corner there, it says that's one. So that's step one of four. The next step will be probably, uh, let's see, this is going to the engine facility. So more than likely, this, this car is getting loaded at Consolidated Petroleum. It's going to get taken to the engine facility and emptied. So now you're going to have an empty tank car that's going to go to some other industry. That would be step two. Step three would be a full car going somewhere else. Step four is an empty car going to uh, Consolidated Petroleum. Okay. Now, you can do this with four cycles. You can do it with two. This is the most paperwork. Uh, the other kicker is there's a, a reconciliation process after the session. You have to make sure that all the cars are matched up with their cards. Um, you know, if somebody, if there's a car missing, then you have to go find the car, and especially in a large layout that could take some time. So you have to be real careful with this. Uh, you do need to create a card for each car in your inventory. And it does focus on the car types, the reporting marks and the number. This is probably the most I mean, honestly, this is the most realistic system because you're always moving a particular car to a particular industry, but it's not for everybody. It does tend to get more complicated. Uh, the other option a lot of people are using is JMRI Operations Pro. This is free software uh, available as part of the JMRI package. Instead of individual, car, individual cards, this generates a switch list. Same concept, you're taking a particular car between two locations. Uh, the software generates it all. You have to enter all your cars and all your industries and all your track links into the software. And there's still a reconciliation process. You still have to make sure that all the cars got to where they were supposed to be so that when you start the software the next time, it, uh, it kind of knows where everything's at. Okay. All right, a few last things. Um, passenger trains, some people like them, some people don't. Um, most places I've been have at least a passenger train or two running the layout. If nothing else, it adds to the variety. If you play, if you play Amtrak gets high priority, then that can mix things up a bit because all of a sudden, instead of Amtrak getting stuck in the siding like it does in the real life, Amtrak gets high priority. And so everybody else has to get out of the way for it. Um, if you're modeling older, you know, older eras, passenger trains did get the right of way. They were considered, you know, the highest priority traffic, especially if it was the mail. Um, there are operations available for this. You may be switching cars in and out, even in modern day. I don't know if it is right now, but Empire, Empire Builder would combine cars uh, from Portland and Seattle to make one train. Uh, they used to have the express freight box cars that would get, get swapped at stations. Uh, REA cars, which were express freight. Uh, it wasn't just REA, but there were lots of express freight cars that got tied onto passenger trains. You may need to turn the whole train around. Um, you know, if all the passenger seats were facing one direction, you may actually have to go through a balloon track and turn it around. Uh, you can do commuter trains. Um, I actually have a a North Star commuter train that services Minneapolis and then goes up to the Northwest that will come in and out of my railroad just because I really like the train and my business was named North Star Computer Systems. So um, uh, you may decide, you know, we don't have enough people to run, so you just don't run the passenger train. It's simply another option. Um, other things you can do to, to mix things up. Um, you can have a maintenance of maintenance of way train. You could simply say this section's out of service. And instead of it being double track, well, now you're into single track and the dispatcher has to work around it. Um, fan trips. Uh, this is a perfect way to, that I can have my Canadian Pacific Royal Hudson running right alongside my modern 
BNSF and CP equipment. It's a fan trip, you know, just run the, run the classic train, give it to somebody to run just to, just to mix things up. Um, you can have random events when the train reaches a certain point, they can draw a card, they can roll dice. Um, and you know, it's okay. Well, this, you, you know, in your case, the, the fifth car from the end has broken down. You need to leave it at the next yard. Um, there was one, uh, BNSF had a massive avalanche a few weeks ago. Well, that'd be quite, a, quite the random event. Okay. Session's over. We main lines blocked, you know, it, probably not so much fun, but, uh, Again, it's all it's all to add to the simulation effect of running a railroad in real life, right? The, you know, this is a it's a, got a slow order, right? You can only go 20 miles an hour through here, or this, you know, this track is blocked. You have to go around it, or uh, things like that. But as far as, far as some takeaways, start small. Um, you don't have to have timetable, train order, four cycle car card, way built the first day. Okay, the, the idea is just start, start trying something. You know, if you've never done it before, every NMRA convention I've ever been to has operating sessions that are open to anybody who is attending. Go try one out. You know, it, it, you might like it, you might not. I mean, some people like this part of the hobby, some people don't, and that's perfectly fine. But give it a try. At a minimum, you get to run on somebody else's railroad. And that's, on some of the railroads, I mean, that's, that's a rare, you know, I've gotten to run on, you know, Bruce Chubb's railroad. I got to run on uh, one that was basically simulating part of Alan McClellan's B&O railroad. I mean, these are, you know, as far as I'm concerned, these are legendary railroads and rail, you know, model railroaders. And to get to to get to see that and actually get to play trains on their railroad is, you know, quite the event. Um, don't be afraid to try something. Um, you know, if it doesn't work, okay, well, don't do that again. Or, you know, get make sure you're getting feedback from your operators. You know, hey, I re I reorganized the, the track over here. Or we we did this thing with the train. Let me know how it came out, right? Because if you're not getting feedback, then you're not going to know how it went. Um, especially if you're hosting your own sessions, you should not be do as the host of the session. You need to be kind of keeping an eye on everything not trying to run everything, but sort of floating back and being the superintendent, right? This is not the time that you necessarily get to run all the trains yourself. You need to be there to help solve problems and to observe, wow, we keep having issues at this one spot. I need to take a look at that before my next session, you know? Uh, take the, uh, you know, steal, beg, borrow, and steal the ideas from other railroads. Um, take the ones you like, skip the ones you don't. And, any, and I still contest that any type of operation will make your railroad more interesting to run. Um, as far as resources, uh, if you visit opsig.org, we have lots of beginner resources. We have a whole book on doing model railroad operations once you exhaust what's up on the website. Um, this is a site that I built called operatingsessions.com, um, which I'm certainly hoping will start getting more popular as we're coming out of the pandemic. People are getting vaccinated. People can start getting together again uh, to find sessions near you. Uh, there are railroads all over the country that are registered and hopefully there'll be a huge pent up demand once the pandemic is over, people can get back to operating. So with that, that's the end of my presentation. So if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take, take any questions you might have. When you're first setting up and, and you've got a layout, this is Mike Sullivan, um, that uh, may or may not have been specifically designed for operating, what's the best way? You'll, you'll kind of figure out, okay, I have three towns and two sidings, but then uh, you just want to jump right in? I, I'm trying to... Sure. It, it kind of depends on the type of railroad, but the idea is you need to see well, what you're, what you're comfortable with, right? Can you get, you know, some of the layouts I see pop up on the various Facebook groups, they have one industry track and that's it. 
Okay, well, that's going to be kind of hard to simulate anything. It's like, can you add on another track? Can you, you know, if we traverse your railroad, can I get from, you know, can we designate a point as sort of the start and another point as the end of the railroad? Now, if it's an okay. oval or some sort of continuous run, it might be that, and this is something we did on the Purdue Club, you might even say, okay, the first time around, you know, you might say we need to go three times around the loop. And the first time around, we're going to stop here. The second time around, we're going to stop at the second siding. Third time around, we're going to stop at the third. And then this train is going to pull into this, into the, the parking track. Uh, that's, that's something I've seen. I just saw this on Sunday, in fact, that he had a very small layout, but he wanted to operate. So he simply went three times around to simulate the time. But mm -hmm. basically the idea is that, you know, you need to kind of look at the railroad and say, all right, what can I, you know, where can I simulate moving something from and to? Can I, do I have a, a, you know, even if it's like, and again, I don't know what kind of layout you have or what it looks like, but um, the, the idea is that I really want to simulate something arriving and something departing, right? If it's a matter of, okay, this train will pick it up. And when it gets back to here, if I don't have a place to park the train, okay, well, maybe I pull that car off and put it in a drawer. And then I swap in a different car. You know, I'm thinking like the, the four by eight oval that I had as a kid, well, there really wasn't a start and an end, and an end for it, but I did have places that I, you know, I had sightings. It's like, okay, well, I could have done operations at that point simply by saying, okay, pick up this car, Go three times around. And once you get back here, okay, that car comes on. You know, it's it's reached the end of it. But it's kind of hard to tell. But I, I think the idea is just start figuring out where can you move a train from and to. You know, how many car space? You know, how many places do you have for cars to be to be parked? You know, you have lots of sidings. You have no sidings. Um, you know, if it's something where something like a something like a loop, well, you could add on a staging yard, like right? just a short two or four foot section that just kind of bolts on, or you can make it a cartridge or something and just put a siding kind of going off. I'm thinking again back to my kids' layout or my 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 childhood layout. Put a siding just kind of going off the railroad and then build on. A little segment that can be your your staging right the train comes out of the staging goes over here picks up some cars comes back and maybe has to back into the staging yard that would be one way to kind of retrofit in operations if you will does that make okay. sense yeah thanks All right. Well, if there aren't any other questions, I'll thank you for your attention. Um, Owen, thanks for the opportunity to present.